It's not genius, but courage that changes the heart. How many agree with that? Yeah, it's not. I mean, my story from pain to purpose tells that. I, I always said when I, when I was in Africa and I walked off that stage that day, I, I had the privilege of speaking to some of the most amazing world leaders in Africa. And the one that was just absolutely, there was Mengabe and there's him in Zimbabwe. He came I literally was coming off the stage, and he was beelining towards me. And my heart just went, oh. I thought, what did I say? You know, there was interpreter, right? So who knows what I said? You know, I'm thinking, my first line was, trust me, it was interpreted wrong, right? It's like, it's not what I said. But he said to me, Dr. Pomba, it's not your years of school. It's not your intelligence. I mean, he went through it. He said, it's the victory that God gave you that gives you the authority. And that was like, and he's so powerful, that was all he said, walked away. And it wasn't until years later that I actually realized that to be true. You know, so it just kind of says, you go, oh, yeah, that's true, right? And then you, know, you realize as life goes on how true that absolutely is, you know. And it's really not. I mean, it's, if you truly, truly are going to change the heart, you know, it is courage. But where does courage come through? It, you, when you look back at your life, unfortunately, and this scares me at times, it's always the hard stuff, isn't it? It's always the hard stuff that really defines us and gives us that confidence and, you know, builds us to the humans, you know, that God needs us to be. And, you know, no doubt that's the case in my life. Well, look, you know, fasting, this is not the cover. This was just a prelude, uh, just a soft edit, and we released some of these at my last seminar. But now the, the actual fully professionally edited version hardcover is coming out uh, at the end of June. Beyond fasting um, has been a work in love of my life. And it, it's funny because um, I, I said Bill Cole, his son's here, Ryan. Uh, he's doing okay this morning, better. He had a little uh, episode, I think, in the middle of the night, you know, so we'll just, you know, continue to hold him up in our prayers. I, I, it's funny because yesterday, I, I didn't even know Bill was coming. Anyways, we started talking about early on, and some of you have heard me say that, uh, you know, I studied fasting passionately in the 90s. It was with his dad. So we had that conversation yesterday, right? And, and uh, it was amazing because I put something together for the first time. I'm thinking, why did I shelf fasting for so long? Because we were talking about the miracles of what we saw with fasting. You know, this woman, she had a grapefruit-sized tumor, right? And Bill and I have just had this boldness when we believed in something, we were just all in. And she didn't want to do the surgery. They didn't, you know, it was a very complicated surgery. They thought, blah, blah, blah. I said, you need to fast. And, you know, I was studying fasting. She was the first person I ever officially fasted, right? 26 days later, all water, she was oozing out of her skin. I mean, this is my first official, like, fasting a patient, right? I mean, you know, who does that anyway, right? And she stunk so bad, her family was like, are you sure she's going to live? Because the whole house stinks. They had fans. They were creating literally cross-ventilation because they couldn't stand her smell. In the first week, I'm thinking, maybe this isn't the right thing. Maybe she is going to die. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like reading it's one thing, but actually experiencing it's another, right? And, you know, she, you know, kept, she kept coming in. And as I saw her come in after a week, after that, she then started coming in bounding. She still stunk, honestly. But she came in bounding, and she would tell all these stories, and look at this, and look at my, my you know, I mean, just horrific things. And, and Bill kept saying to me, dude, do you think this is okay? You know, it's like, I mean, that was exact words. Dude, do you think this is okay? You think we should keep fasting? Or I'm like, absolutely. You know, I'm like, oh, God, I hope so. <laughs> Bottom line, it worked out. She lived. No, her, her tumor literally, by the end of that fast, it went to the size of a golf ball. And the doctors were like, holy cow. And then she did another fast and another fast. And by, I think, like the third fast, she fasted it away. She fasted herself to health, honestly. So that was my first experience clinically. I mean, of course, I fasted myself, and I, you know, had the experience with my wife, too. And I, I can't remember where that was, before that, after that. But, you know, we went in, and, and my wife had, this is when her hormones were jacked up, and we didn't even know it was from her lead at that point. And she went in, and um, they did a colposcopy, and the, they actually, or I think it started with a pap smear, and they no, looked at abnormal cells. They said it was stage four. You know, 
This is basically cancer already or one step away. You have, we have to go in there and remove blah, blah, blah. I'm like, mm-mm, nope. You know, that was it. You're fasting. because That's what I was studying. And <laughs> thank God it could have been something else. <laughs> but she did. Because my wife does what I tell her to do, no doubt. And she fasted. And uh, the funny thing, I never forget his words. Because I said, well, we're just not going to do that, you know. And I didn't tell him what we were going to do. But his words were, you'll be back. And we never were back. And it all was normal. And that was so many years ago, you know, in the 90s sometime. But, you know, the bottom line was, is that was my first experiences with fasting. And, and then there were so many others that. So the question was, why the heck did I shelf it for so many years? Well, I blame his father. I do. I blame Bill Cole. Um, because Bill is... He's so, like, I mean, he can get dogmatic and negative about things, right? And so I was always the one going, let's do this, right? It's like, ah, uh, you know, and then he'd have, like, 20 negatives, and by the end of, like, a few days, I'd be like, he's right, you know, next. Uh, so we went, we were going to a lot of different fasting clinics and looking at what they were doing, and I was reading all of Herbert Shelton's stuff, which I have a picture of, but, and I was studying everything I could on fasting, and so... We went, and uh, how many of you know who Joel Furman is? It was one of the clinics that we went to and just saw his setup. Well, as it turned out, Joel was not monetizing this, right? I mean, matter of fact, Joel actually asked us if he could work for us at one point, you know, and it was like, hmm, you know, that's not good. So I was still gung-ho that we're going to make this work. Bill was like, forget it. There's just, you know, who's going to pay for this, right? No, but, I mean, he brought up all the negatives, and eventually I agreed with him. And we just kind of put it on the shelf. And I used it just periodically, wouldn't pay, you know, did had no way of monetizing it, but it was always in who I was. And then it was some years later, you know, even about 10 years ago where I fasted somebody else. And, you know, and then I just started saying, okay, we're going to use this. And I, I started off, and those of you who have been coaching with me for a while, you know, we started off doing some different types of fast, partial fast, because I studied this guy from France, Albert Magier, you know, and just kind of incorporated it back into my protocols. The moment I did, it was transformational. I mean, it was like, gosh, I should have been doing this, you know, consistently all along. Because when you put it with the detox, immediately it was like that's the thing that was missing. You know, and I, I say, oh, gosh, imagine if I would have kept doing it, where would I be today if I kept studying fasting doing it clinically. But you know what? Timing is everything. The thing that was missing from it was the detox. Because, and honestly, because when people fast, and Shane talked about this yesterday, one of the big pitfalls is you dig so deep via autophagy into fat cells and visceral cells that people can get these crazy things that happen. And, and back then, like some of these clinics, I mean, they were fasting people long term. They, they just miss this because these people, looking back, I was like, gosh, they just missed the detox. And they missed something that is absolutely crucial. Shane mentioned yesterday about the study at 13 hours, you, uh, they see signs of autophagy, right? And, but that's only really in fat-adapted people, right? So there's a difference going into a fast completely fat-adapted and not. So one of the points of this book is this is what myself and the platinum doctors do. This is what we take people through step by step, you know? And when I had the opportunity just to put that in writing, you know, I realized I had a book. But the idea is if you take a month ahead at least and you prepare somebody for the fast, instead of waiting till day four, and the average person, they really don't get results at day four or five if they get their dramatic results that we read about because they're that sick and toxic. They really don't get the autophagy and the stem cell production. So if you prepare them and fat adapt them and get them into the diet variation strategies, et cetera, then they go into the fast and instead of day four, maybe getting results, they start getting results day one. And that's that study where you start to see autophagy at 13 hours. And there was just a study. Someone sent it to me uh, just the other day. It was, I think it was out in uh, this May. Uh, MIT, they showed 24 hours, what happens in 24-hour fast, right? And they talked about how the gut cells literally transformed, you know, in the fast, which we know. 
Clinically, we see that. I always say that we could never fix a gut today if we were just giving someone bacteria. And that doesn't mean that's not part of our protocol. It is. But really, the truth is that we transform the worst guts by these fasting strategies. Not just one fast. Be clear. With each fast, the body gets more and more efficient. A deeper level of autophagy occurs. A deeper level of stem cells occurs. So I am going to show you, and you'll have access to the diet variation strategies that we use. And when the book comes out in June, you'll have access to everything. But the, the fact is, is though, when Shane was putting this product together, I was the one that said, listen, make sure the protein, because all these products on the market, I would love to use them for partial fasting, which is very powerful, and I'll explain. But the protein is too high and it knocks you out of autophagy, right? So there's three things, and you're going to hear this again, that can knock you out of autophagy. It's too many calories, obviously, too much protein, or too many carbs, right? All those can knock you out of autophagy and ruin a partial fast or a fasting state. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, the product actually fit into that because I said, I really want to use this product for partial fasting. Prolone, how many of you are familiar with it? I just interviewed James Kelly yesterday, or yesterday or the day before. Anyway, the time just like uh, elapses in these seminars. I have no idea what day it is right now. What day is this? Thank you. So two days ago, it was Wednesday. <laughs> Anyways, you know, one, one thing that the pro-loan people, and I love Walter Longo, I feel, I feel loyal to that group. I do, because of the research they're doing. And they love me. They love our message. And so I, I'm able to work closely with them and, and have access to their scientists. And some of them spoke at my seminars a couple times. Um, so I, there's nothing negative to say, except, and it's not negative. They've come out, Walter came out of the vegan world in the plant-based world. So his bend is that way. When they talk about fasting, water fasting, they talk about losing muscle. And, you know, oh, you'll lose, lose muscle. That's why a partial fast is, is better. And I, I love partial fasting. But I never would say one's better than the other because there's different reasons to do different fasts at different times. However, when they say the, all the muscle loss, you know, they, they're not understanding that when you go into a fast, fat adapted, that you know, I think, you know, Dr. Fung at one of my seminars showed, it's, it's really lasts maybe 24 hours, right? Don, is that right? About 24 hours, that period of gluconeogenesis where the body will break down muscle. I'm thinking of uh, Fung's one slide of the study where they look. But it's about a 24-hour period where you go through that process of losing some muscle. That's it. And then what does your body do? Because it's smart enough not to say, wait a minute, we can't cannibalize our muscle. We have to survive and run from a lion. So it starts that hormone optimization. It starts raising up growth hormone. And all these, the cells become hormone sensitive. All because it says, I can't burn muscle. So it's not really true that in a water fast you lose all that muscle. That, that's actually a myth. But the fact is, is that when it's done right and we walk somebody through this process ahead of time, when they enter a fast, not only is the fast easier, but their results start day one. And that's not my opinion. That's by the studies in this new MIT study out, you know, shows that as well. So a group, we started doing the, uh, the stenomic program in our platinum group, and the results have been extraordinary. Matter of fact, Duncan, I'm going to put you on the spot. Come on up here. Could you, is there a mic? I literally didn't tell him I was going to bring him up, and I, I was going to tell him yesterday. I'm like, nah, let's just let him come from the heart. Nah, just may put them right on the spot instantly. But so we started doing a program. With this book, we also have a workbook for our platinum doctors. And we're doing these six-week classes. And it's, I built a whole practice based on the extreme makeover years ago. And literally, I, it was like the only thing I did to market the practice. And what I did is educated my community. And I did it with a topic that was really hot. Remember the extreme makeovers? How hot they were, right? And we would just constantly put, you know, 100, 200 people in a room. And the more they got going, the more it was easier to market, actually, because we didn't sell anyone anything. I just brought them amazing information, and they just wanted to come in my clinic. Or if they were in my clinic, they wanted everything that we did. Because after about week three, you had such rapport with them. They were just like, you know, what do you do? What's it, chiropractic? Oh, I would, oh, yeah, we'll give you a free. All of a sudden, you noticed that. So tell us about your experience with the Stenomic program. Okay, well, first of all, 
it's just it's been really fun for one and you know if you're not having fun then what the heck what, why are you doing it but uh, so the first dynamic course I did I had I did most of it in-house I had some uh, virtual but I had about 25 people there and it was just phenomenal I mean by week th two the second week one guy told me and he was a construction worker he goes I'm off 40 ibuprofen a week one week of changing the food he ate I mean it was just I didn't even know he was doing that because he wasn't a patient. And then another woman said, yeah, I'm off 21 ibuprofen a week. So just by getting the um, inflammation, the inflammatory foods out of the body has just been phenomenal. And then also, you know, people start losing weight almost immediately. Like I just got an a email from one of my patients. We're in our second week. People are losing six, seven pounds many, in the first week. How many of week. these have you done? This, this is my third one right third now. Third one, yeah. yeah. And, and you, they've brought patients to your office. Oh, I mean, yeah, ob so. obviously. I mean, they all bring patients. One patient's brought, I think, five different people to this class mm -hmm. now. And people are just seeing such great results, brain fog going away. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really fun. And it's so simple. They all say it's so easy. There is not yeah. a problem with it. You know, it's funny. You were one of the ones that said, well, Dr. Pombo, how do we close them? Yeah. Because, you know, we would do, like, thyroid talks. And if you do a thyroid one-day talk, yeah, you have to have a close, right? And, of course, not everyone's great at that, and nor should you be, perhaps, right? But the fact is, is I was like, there's no close. Yeah, you know, one of the things <laughs> is I've been a chiropractor for 30 years, so I'm a, you know, straight chiropractor, you know, as far as that's what saved my life. However, when I'm starting to get into this, like, you know, I kept trying to get people to want to do chiropractic when they came in for the nutrition, and Dr. Pompe just kept saying, just let it happen. Just don't even talk to them about chiropractic, and they'll come up to you. Sure enough, you know, after the third or fourth week, it's like, you know, what about my neck? I thought, oh, you have a neck problem. they trust problem. you now. Yeah. yeah. And it's so easy. It's so much easier to convert people to, you know, lifetime care, chiropractic, and nutrition with this program. And I want to just share the one um, amazing win. This guy was, he's uh, 79 years old, and he was referred in by uh, another elder woman who's had just amazing results. And he got up one day, he goes, I want to share today. And I go, okay. So this is like his, uh, maybe week four. He goes, I'm a diabetic, I'm on dialysis. And I've been, number one, my biggest win is that I no longer live to eat he goes, I've lived to eat my whole life, meal to meal to meal. And I can't even imagine that that's gone. But I went to my cardiologist, who is from Stanford, and he said and my blood sugar went from 235 to 95. And, um, you know, I've lost, like, I think at this point, 15 pounds. And um, the, he goes, the cardiologist just looked at it, asked him what he did, and started talking to him about the food pyramid. Yeah. Just unbelievable. And he goes, you know, I went to a, a course once when I was very young, and somebody said, don't let anybody steal your dreams. So he said, I walked out of there. A week later, he went to his endocrinologist for his diabetes, and his blood sugar was so low, he goes, I don't want to see you for a year. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. So it's just phenomenal. The changes are great. It's so much fun, and just I'm just going to keep doing one after the one after another after another. There's no reason not to. That, that's how I that's how I built. Thank you, Duncan. Give him a big hand. Um, honestly, that that's how I built my you know my practice uh, when I you know I started over after I you know our, I had a big chiropractic practice, and uh, this practice was a cross between chiropractic and functional medicine, and. I wasn't clever enough to do clever marketing. I'm just not that guy. But I was absolutely loved educating the people and bringing them real information. And, and that's how I did it. And I'll tell you right now, it just so happens that fasting is now in vogue. Again, when I was back in the 90s, I, I jokingly said, Bill and I were the only actually really normal people that were into fasting. We'd go to these, we'd go to these fasting things. We'd look around and be like, man, we're, we're not in Kansas anymore. You know, it was like, it was just a really weird group. I can just tell you that. And, uh, you know, but now it's completely different. Thank God. But, you know, I mean, fasting is transformative. It really is. You know, you, you hear these stories and it, it's counterintuitive. You know, people don't get it today, man, because all we do is feast. And, you know, our grandmothers told us, what? You know, it's like, you need to eat. You need to eat, right? It's like, and the fact is, is our genetics, our DNA at the survival level are set up to fast. So feast famine is not my opinion. It's, it's something that's just, we need to do. And when you do it, the innate intelligence takes over. 
So when you look at the seven reasons I give to fast, you know, of course, autophagy. Everyone in this room now knows autophagy, right? And, and really what it's all about. You know, we get rid of the bad cells and the bad DNA. And then, of course, every cell your body gets rid of, because that's one of the myths, right? Your fault, how do your body get nutrition? Come on, it's so smart. It goes after the really bad cells to get what it needs to survive. And it gets rid of the bad. But here's the cool part. It will stimulate a stem cell, every cell it takes out and replaces. And we realize that some of these miracles that we saw in fasting back in the day, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't even understand the word autophagy or stem cells. As a matter of fact, one of the criticisms of fasting was that it lowers your immune system. All clinically, the answer that I heard was, well, look, all we really know is it brings down hyperimmunity and it upregulates good immunity. I don't know how that happens, but it happens. Well, today we know. Today we know that it's doing that. We, and the, by the way, the reason they gave that criticism is because we, you know, we would run bloods during fast, and you every time, 100% of the time, you see this drop in white blood cells. So that looks like a lower immunity. But what we didn't understand at that time and now do is the fact is, is it was getting, your body's intelligence was getting rid of all of those hyperactive, bad white blood cells that drive every, listen, every one of us have some level of autoimmunity, meaning, you know, bad cells doing bad things and driving some low-grade inflammation. So therefore, when you look at someone who just is extremely healthy, looks far younger than their actual age, I promise you, they have less senescent cells. Those are cells that live too long and do naughty things, drive inflammation. So they have low-grade inflammation, or they have less inflammation, and they have less of these nasty cells. So how do we get there? Fasting is really the only way that I truly know to really change your cellular age to that level. Now, again, if you're toxic, you've got another problem. That's why when we put these two things together, we have something very magical. But anyway, so we know that it gets rid of those bad white blood cells, and then what does it do? It raises up, it releases a new stem cell, and then you create a new white blood cell that's more naive. It's not driving the inflammation. It's simple. And that's why we would note that autoimmune would turn off. My wife got rid of her allergies. I, when I met Marilee, she literally, every spring, She'd be laying in bed with compresses on her eyes. And I mean, just, I mean, I, days like this. I'd be like, what? Like, who does this? Right? I mean, I grew up on a, a different diet. I'm, you know, her period, she would be taking like big pills. I didn't even know what they were because I never took a drug in my life. These big things, they were, guess, Motrin or some damn thing, right? And I'm like, why, why, you take, why do you take that? Like, I mean, my, my father, being the bricklayer, just raised me, as I said yesterday, just with such a different mindset. I had no philosophy, really, except what he gave me. And I just thought, that's so crazy. I don't understand why you would do that. Anyways, as we went on, you know, of course she changed her diet, but she still had these allergies. And it was fasting that got rid of that hyperimmunity, and now she had, gets no allergies. So, you know, it's not, you know, was her gene turned on? Of course it was. But her gene got turned off, and her body's de-inflamed. So that's the point. So anyways, you know, elevated ketones, you know, Shane talked a lot about ketones yesterday. You know, look, look, burn clean. He showed that, right? What we know that it activates stem cells, heals the brain, resets the microbiome. He, he showed all of those things yesterday. But here's the point I want to make about this. When we look at the clinically, the levels of ketones that it takes to truly reset the gut, most people aren't seeing those levels of ketones when they're in ketosis. Do you understand? It's the higher levels. And maybe that's an argument for, you know, periodically throwing down some exogenous ketones, but the fact is, is the only way to get those higher levels consistently is fasting. And even daily fasting, to some degree, will give you those higher ketones in the afternoon. So when I'm not even in ketosis, my morning number, let's say I'm 0 0.2, 0 0.3 in the morning, and that's when you measure your beta-hydroxybutyrate, best time first thing in the morning. If you're over 0.5, you're in ketotic state for new people. But let's say I'm 0.2, I'm not in ketosis. By the afternoon, when I typically eat my first meal, say around 3 or 4 o'clock, I measure my ketones. I'm always in ketosis. I don't care if I'm eating 200 grams of carbs. Now, again, that's not going to happen to most of you. That efficiency comes over time as you become more metabolically flexible. And even when I switch my diet, I still benefit from some ketones later in the day. So we want to benefit from these higher ketones. When I'm in ketosis and I start my day, let's say I'm one or 0.8 in the morning. 
By the afternoon, oftentimes I'm 2.5, right? Depending on how long I make that fast go. If I just eat one meal, oftentimes I see even threes. So the point is, is that to really see the higher ketones that really can change the brain, heal the gut, we need these fasting states. Now, what we'll see is many people who are sick and challenged, they can't hit those levels until they do a five-day fast, right, docs? So that we the fast people, right? I mean, we don't see those really high numbers, three to eight, you know, until we get down the road. The other magical thing that happens in a long fast is that if you study Seyfried's stuff, and he looks at autophagy as looking at how tumors shrink or not, right? And that's how I came up with knowing if your coffee works in, a, in an intermittent fast or not. But the fact is, is that um, ah, I lost my point because I, I was thinking of that coffee thing that everyone asks about. Gosh, don't let me forget that, because some of you are new. You still need to hear that. <laughs> Does that work for my fast? But anyways, um, tumors. Yeah, so he watches the tumors. You know, if they're shrinking, they know they're in this autophagy state. And one of the things was is that to get the high levels of ketones, he always says, look, you could be looking at your ketones at three. This is a really important point. But if your glucose is still 80 or 90, you're really not getting those, those benefits that we're looking at in studies. So what they found is, is that when glucose was still up, we didn't see tumors shrinking. Even though the ketones were up, we didn't see the microbiome changes. We, so what's going on? So what we know is glucose has to drop and ketones have to rise. That's why I teach you guys how to measure morning glucose and ketones. And we want to see, even in an intermittent daily fast, we want to see that shift. Okay, if we don't see that shift, we're, we got something wrong, right? We need to go backwards and say, okay, let's relook at this. So we want to see that drop in glucose and raising ketones. So my point is this, though. We oftentimes don't see that happen until we do multiple fasts. By the third or fourth fast, now when they're intermittent fasting daily, now we'll see the glucose dropping and the ketones rising. So it takes a lot of different fasts and, and adaptation to occur before we can see that right thing happen. So don't be confused. Just because you're seeing high ketones, glucose is still playing a major, major role. And that's why it's important to clinically measure glucose and ketones. So longer fasts, many of them, is what most Americans need to actually break through, to really see that max autophagy. And how do I measure max autophagy? We want to see a one-to-one -one ratio, and I got that from Seyfried, but a one-to-one -one ratio between your glucose and your ketones. And again, for new people, come to my seminar. <laughs> but anyway, it's very complicated. But anyways, the bottom line is you have to take, let's say your glucose is 80. You divide it by 18, okay? And then you get a number. Let's just make one up. I don't know the math. Let's say it's 3.2, okay? So 3.2. The one-to-one -one would be now if your ketones were 3.2. Now we know autophagy is working for you. And, and Seyfried studied that target zone as he refer references it. Um, based on looking at what's happening via tumors, cancer, autophagy in the body. Pretty, pretty accurate way of assessing it. So we know that we can hit max autophagy once we see that one-to-one -one ratio. Here's the point. You're not going to see that typically unless you're doing what? Fasting. In a longer-term fast. Your patients need this autophagy state to get well. They do. We have to create this max autophagy, this one-to-one -one ratio. And the more you do that, the more someone's getting rid of these bad, old, senescent cells, and the more stem cells. Every one of you have stem cells. The problem is, is you look around the room, and you, know, you can always, in any crowd, I'm not picking on this crowd, any crowd, and you can see the people whose stem cells are just not viable. How do we wake them up? We wake them up via this fasting. We're genetically designed to feast famine. Times with food, times with less food, times with no food. All of it is the key. All right, let's get into some of this. The, I'm going to zip through some of these fasting. And I, I didn't get through all these, but one of my favorites is energy diversion, meaning it takes so much energy to process food. What does your innate intelligence do when it doesn't have to waste that energy? And not waste it, but utilize the energy into assimilating food. It doesn't just let that energy go. No, it drives it to things that your innate intelligence wanted to heal for 20, 30 years. And all of a sudden, it starts working on those. And what we see is this. With every fast, your body retraces and goes back and 
tries to fix that extra stuff that it wanted to for years, but it was trying to survive, and it was dealing with what it know it needed to do, but when you give it that extra energy via a fast, the energy diversion is amazing. And hormone optimization, we talk a lot about reset your DNA, reset your microbiome. Okay, so Shane actually hit all those. This guy was the one who started the autophagy craze. He's from Japan, and uh, that's just a quote from him. But basically, hey, man, he won the Nobel Prize for showing this, and it's just expanded since 2016. And, and it wasn't that people really, autophagy was talked about a little differently before that, but he definitely put it on the map with some of his work. Well, but if we go back in fasting, I mentioned Herbert Shelton. You know, I was reading his books. This guy had book after book, and I was buried in his work. Now, again, I, he had some things that um, I probably wouldn't have agreed with, uh, you know, today, but it's amazing what he knew back then. He fasted over 40,000 people. I think he learned some things, you know? I mean, honestly, I, I think of things today, and I go, gosh, how did I know that? It was because I read something of that, and it just popped out of my brain. By the way, I always say this, and you guys know this, but my dyslexia, and this kind of brings our, where we started full forward. You know, my dyslexia, the very thing that gave me insecurities as an adult, the very thing that I was like, you know, thought I was the dumbest kid in the class and overcompensated in other ways, you know, it's like realize now that it's that dyslexia and my, billet, my brain's, you know, attempts to compensate is why I can remember things and go, oh, that, you know, it just, I pull it up in a file somewhere, and it's because of my dyslexia. But Herbert Schell and stuff pops into my brain constantly, constantly. You know, and, and I love that. You know, every religion disagrees on everything, even prayer, right? I mean, everything, except one thing, fasting. And I'm sure I missed some religions on there. I was just off the top of my head when I put the PowerPoint together. But fact is, is that every religion agrees on fasting. There must be something there, right? I mean, come on. You know, I, everyone always asks this, how long can someone fast? You know, it wasn't Don Clum. Don Clum did, how many days, Don? Where is he? How many days did you do, 32? 30. So it wasn't Don Clum. It was actually this, fa uh, this guy here. Um, you know, that's pretty amazing, right? He fasted 382 days. Uh, and again, all his nutrition markers remain normal. How? Now, again, he was obese, right? So he had a lot to feed from. The point is, is the body's intelligence figured it out, Right? So those of you who don't weigh 400 pounds, I wouldn't recommend fasting that long. Um, however, some of these longer fasts are pretty transformative. You know? So I, I think that one thing I have learned in my years in clinically, and then I learned it clinically before I actually looked at Longo's work, multiple shorter fasts, not only is it easier and safer, but it actually works better for some people. And for people who would benefit from a long fast, they can get there doing multiple short fasts as well. I'm not against extended fasts for certain people. But the fact is, is in your clinics, you're not a fasting clinic. Stick to shorter fasts, and you'll get there. Trust me, you will. So you don't need to do longer fasts. We had a guy, uh, who was at the seminar, Tammy? I know you were. Remember the gentleman? He was Randy's patient. Uh, he was on 120 days of just water. You remember that too, right? Yeah, 120 days. You remember his testimony? I mean, this guy was on, I think, 14 medications. And at that point, he, you know, he was off all of them. And, I mean, psychotropic drugs, massive depression. I mean, this guy was basically, he was a man walking dead, and he had his life back. 120, 120 days of water. Now, here was the thing. He was in one of my platinum education groups, uh, and I was teaching on fasting. And I gave signs to know when to break a fast. And he's like, that just started last week. And I said, well, if it keeps progressing, you need to break a fast. He broke the fast a week later. Um, and, and I'm not going to teach you on how to know to break a fast. But I learned it from Herbert Shelton, by the way, on how to do all that. Okay, um, multiple fasts. And there's the point I was making. Multiple fasts um, is a key, right? So, I mean, all of those things we have noted clinically, and the science goes with it, too benefit from multiple fasts. It was funny because I was in a mastermind with uh, Thomas Seyfried, and he, I was talking about this because they were picking my brain clinically. What do you notice when blah, blah, blah. And then Thomas said, Dan, oh my gosh, I have to send you the study that I found on Oscar the dog from 1912. You should see this thing. And he didn't blow the dust off. He did send it via email. But anyways, 
with every fast, Oscar got better results. You have to understand what was happening with the dogs. They were actually fasting the dogs to death. And basically, the goal was to see where, you know, this premortal rise starts. So they were basically noting the blood and what happens, etc. Well, Oscar did some naughty things during the fast. He got a hold of some food. He kept screwing up, right? So he'd fast for like whatever days. Then he'd, you know, but they kept pulling, putting Oscar back into like each one. He, Oscar was really smart, so he kept finding food. The bottom line is Oscar ended up fasting several times. What happened was is this, and I quoted one of the things here. So. Uh, he, he got to 101 days, and now Oscar was still jumping in and out of the cage. He wouldn't die. They couldn't kill him. They actually stopped the fast for Oscar and let him live. But here's the thing. With every fast, doc, he became, as I just quoted the thing, but more efficient and grew stronger, all around better physical condition. So with each fast, so that's when, when he said, Dan, you're right. Multiple fasts, people get like, it's better and better and better. And I think James Kelly um, from Prolone, in my interview on Wednesday, he, he noted that in their Valter studies, that they do put people on five days next month, another five days next month, three months. They say that in three months, even the average person, they see each fast, they see massive more autophagy happening each time. And then they said after that, the average person gets just fast a couple times a year. And their new study is doing, showing that, uh, you know, how it really is extending your life, et cetera. But so if you do some consistent fasting and then just put it in your regiment, in your life, in your lifestyle, it'll change your world. That's why this book is so important. Because not only does it show you how to do it right, but it shows you how to go into a fast that you can get these results much faster. And, and that is the key. But Oscar the dog, we got to imitate Oscar the dog. And there's Walter. And this was, you know, uh, when it came out about how fasting lowers your um, immune, or basically lowers your bad immune system, the, the autoimmune, because it gets rid of bad cells. And then with stem cells, you create new naive T cells. So that's basically what I had already told you. So we know that we can fast autoimmune away. And this is some of Mark Matson's work that I fell in love with. But, you know, I, fasting for the brain is extraordinary. And I, I can't tell you myself and my doctors would tell you, you know, people that have these massive brain conditions, anything, any neurodegenerative concussions, fasting is transformative for the brain. Science shows it, but I can tell you clinically it's powerful. My daughter had her second concussion. The first one, we took her to Life University, and put, they put her in this gyroscope, and she went through the protocol, and it worked, um, but it was arduous. We all know that the second concussion, right, Susie, or the 20th, 25th, how many of you had? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you can tell a lot of stories. No one knows more about the brain and concussions than that woman right there. Pain to purpose, girl. Anyways, so it has become her expertise, pain to purpose. And my daughter, the second one is always harder and worse. So she didn't have access to that. She was down at uh, undergrad in Florida. And I said, fast. And my, my daughter's just like my other kids. They do what I tell them to do, thank God. And she fasted. And, I mean, I'm telling you, within days of the fast, her, all her symptoms went away. And this concussion was worse. And literally weeks to months afterwards, she realized that not only was it better, she felt better than she did. She realized that even, she didn't recover even from the first one fully. And she realized how much better she was. So brain conditions, it's extraordinary. All right, so, you know, you've seen me talk about this. I, I talk, uh, I love water fasting because that's where my early training was. And then I fell in love with partial fasting along the way. So I talk about this French guy. He was fasting people long. And then what he had noticed is that people would all of a sudden start to get this bad uh, things starting to happen. The benefits started sliding. And then on blood, you would start seeing a certain profile, nitrogen going up, perhaps electrolytes dropping, creatine levels rising, and then they would break the fast. But of course, you don't just break a fast and start eating again. You blow all the results, right? Shane mentioned that yesterday. So we don't ever want to do that. So they would move them into a partial fast, low calories. They would move them into more vegetables, so the protein was what? Low. So they were keeping them in autophagy, right? So unknowingly, they would think, okay, we're breaking the fast. We're stopping the healing. What he had noticed in a lot of the cases is the healing would start going back up again. And so then 
these really decrepit people would come in and really sick pet people that he knew would be hard to fast. And he started them in a partial fast. And he noticed that he would get even better outcomes for them, some of those people. So I started duplicating what was in his partial fast from a macro standpoint. And my, fast, my partial fast that my platinums I, I use came out of what I learned from Albert, not Walter. Matter of fact, they found me because they saw me talking about that in some of my videos or something, or at least they read one of my articles. And his CEO found me and said, you know, gosh, you know, do you realize you're doing something that we're proving out right now? And I'm like, oh, really? So fasting mimicking diet because of Walter's studies became well known. But just know this, Walter actually wasn't the one. I, I would give more credit to these uh, earlier. And, and I don't, I, again, Albert, uh, I think, was the first to clinically discuss it and write about it. Um, but we've learned from it. So what is a partial fast? A partial fast is, depending on your body size, your calories around 1,000 to 500. If you're bigger, 1,000 calories works. If you're smaller, definitely stick to around 500. However, there's other factors. So not just calories. What else did I say is a factor? Protein. So we have to keep our protein. If you're bigger, 20. If you're really big, 25 would actually work. So there's no set number. Uh, if you have a lot of muscle, you could actually get away with more protein. But if you're smaller, you know, some people actually need to stick to 15 grams or below to keep the autophagy going. And so, uh, and, and again, oddly enough, Albert talked about that. He knew nothing about mTOR and all these different things and autophagy, but he noticed when the protein got to a certain point or people would eat too much protein, the benefits would stop. So no doubt, their tongue would turn pink and say, I'm done fasting. The body's so smart. So, and we want to keep the calories low, the protein low, and the carbohydrates. At least, I always say, keep it around in that catodic state, around 50, and you're going to be safe, and you'll stay in autophagy. So that's a partial fast. So then Prolone came out with it in the boxes. And they basically said, here's a box, here's a box, here's a box for each day. And they followed basically those parameters. Now, the thing that I don't like about Prolone is the fact that a lot of your SIBO people, they have inulin to help feed. He put it there on purpose because he wants to feed the good bacteria, and inulin's great for that. And I don't have any problem with inulin unless you have what? It drives you spatty and crazy, and you can't do it in bloating. So many of our staff people, we all in, uh, experimented with the fasting mimicking diet, and many of them, Andrea, how many people complained of the bloating? Huge no. It, right? it, was, it was crazy numbers, right? So they, because he comes from a plant-based thing, you know, a lot of that's in there. But as a group of doctors, for a lot of our people, we can't use it, right? I mean, we love it because it's simple, but we just can't use it. So when Shane was putting this product together, I thought, man, this is a great opportunity that we can utilize a product that finally that we can create and utilize in these partial fasts to make it easier. Because here's the problem. I actually never liked partial fasting myself. I, clinically, I like it, but I don't like to do it myself. And the reason why is because there I am in my kitchen trying to prepare my 500 calories, and it's hard for me to stop. It is. I don't like being around it. I don't want, and when I'm preparing food, I want to eat. And I found it, I'm disciplined, so I did it, but I found myself miserable through it. I did. I would be like, God, I just, and when I'm water fasting, I just lose my appetite. I just go about my business and it's no problem. But partial fasting, it seemed like it was just drudgery dealing with food all day. When I did the fasting mimicking diet, it was easy because it was like, here's what I have. Here's what I have. So the new product, I believe, is a really great solution. So if you look at the Catabo facts, we can see that the protein, that's two servings, right? So 12.7. So I calculated in a partial fast, you can have three servings and stay within the parameters of carbohydrates and protein uh, and calories. Because if you look at the calories, it's 275 for two servings. So if you add one more serving to that, you have three servings. You're good on the calories. You're good on the protein at 20, and you're good on the carbohydrates because that's 7.5. That's, uh, that doesn't say 75. So everything works. And it doesn't give the SIBO people the bloat. And we still get the thing of it makes it really easy. So someone already asked me the question, well, can we do all three at once or should we spread three out in the day? Now, I asked Jim, James Kelly that. What did they find with fasting mimicking diet? In, in one of their little trials, they found it really didn't make much of a difference. 
they're, they're going to do a longer study on that to find out. But so the fact is, is you could do it in three servings through the day. You could do two and then one. You could do it in two. My advice would be, if you're used to eating twice a day, do, do it when you get, you know, when you typically eat. So if you eat at three as your first meal, do it then. And if you eat dinner at six, do another serving then. So this is, I think, a really good solution. So, and, and again, I'm not throwing the fasting mimic diet out the window. I think the boxes of eating actual food is actually a really good thing for some people. This gives us another tool to use. So, and by the way, I'm going to show you some of the diet variation, okay? So in that MIT study, they talked about the 5-2 diet, what Matson kind of, you know, um, made popular, where you take two days a week and you just eat 500 calories. Every one of you in the room can take this product and do just that. It's so much easier than actually eating 500 calories because I do that many times. But every time I start like, okay, it's easy for me to just eat one meal a day. And I do that at least two or three times a week. But when I say, you know what, I'm going to push my autophagy even further and I'm just going to eat 500 calories. 50% of the time I fail. I do. Because once I start eating, you know what my brain goes? Ah, hell with it. I'm healthy anyway. Or whatever <laughs> rationalization I came up with. I'm serious. Because once I'm in the kitchen and I see everyone, I just, just keep going. And there goes 500 calories, right? You know, I'm right at 1,500. So, but the fact is, is if I know that this is my meal and I just, here's my two or three scoops, chug it down, I'm done. I'm good with that. As long as I don't play around with food. So my point is you can use this product in a five-day fast and experience amazing autophagy and benefits and make it a little easier on yourself, or you can use it weekly, two to three times a week. If you just do two to three scoops of this instead of a meal, that's your only meal. Magic will happen, I'm telling you. Studies show it. So we have a new tool, and that's why I was excited when Shane was talking about building this product. I said, man, we have to make sure it fits the rules of keeping autophagy going. I kind of hit these myths already, right? I mean, fasting deprives the body of nutrients. Proved that that's not true, right? It's starvation, no energy, weight loss from muscle. That's the one that I said that, you know, Walter's group is really off on, man. It's like when you go into a fast, fat adapted, it's just simply not true. Listen, when I fast, I lose. My last fast, it was in February. I lost five pounds. Now, if I had a lot of fat on my body, would I have lost more? That's how stinking smart the body is, right? I lost five pounds. That's very typical for me. Five-day water fast. Three of it has to be water, glycogen, right? Two of it was, you know, I get a little leaner, but a lot of it's just stinking autophagy. It's pretty amazing. I had natural killer cells injected. I, I won't throw this story too around too much to confuse you, but you take your own blood. They harvest natural killer cells. They expand them. So I started about just over a million, 1.2 million natural killer cells. And after three weeks, they expanded to just over 2 billion. And then they injected them in me. You know what was the coolest thing? Marilyn and I both lost five pounds. Fat-wise, exactly the same. Muscle-wise, exactly the same. What the heck? How did we lose, lose five pounds? You know what it was? Senescent cells. And then the, the scientist said, oh, yeah, that's just senescent cells, man. You crushed that. So we took before and after of senescent cells. Pretty cool. And I was talking to Dave Asprey, and he had this done as well, after me, actually. And he said, man, same thing happened to me, and I urinated for two days. And that's exactly what happened to us. So you're just literally peeing out bad cells. The, ba the bottom line is, is the fasting, you get a similar thing, you know, not to that degree, you know, but each fast, you lose more and more senescent cells. Pretty amazing. So anyways, uh, those are the myths, and we busted them anyway. So, all right, so look, th this is something that I, I spoke about at Bulletproof and Paleo FX. Because here you have a group of low carbers. And when I showed this, and by the way, when you talk to the, like, the people that are big into low carb, this doesn't exist. So this is why I said that the, the, the problem that no one really wants to talk about. So I was curious. I did it at both events. How many, you know, I, I took a poll, right? Hit weight loss, I mean, almost every hand went up, especially the women. So this is like this not talked about thing. And I always tell the story, you know, Joe Mercola, number one, two years ago, Joe Mercola didn't even believe in fasting. 
And through many of our conversations, I've swayed him. But it was in an Orlando conversation that he was, Joe's very disciplined. And I have a lot of respect for him. He practices what he preaches. But he was saying, Dan, I'm losing muscle and I'm gaining fat. And I'm down to 10 grams of carbs a day. And I said, Joe, same thing happened to me. Here's what you need to do. And I explained to him the diet variation. And it, matter of fact, it changes his life so much. Jim Mercola's uh, uh, keto fast is all about that process that I taught him. And basically, feast famine is the way that we've learned clinically to break people out of this mode when they've been low-carb too long. So weight loss resistance on long-term low-carb diets like ketosis or paleo, that's a problem. Muscle loss and fat storage, that was a problem. It happened to me too, not just Joe. That's how I literally fell into a lot of these discoveries because I was down to like eating zero carbs. Belly fat was getting worse, and I was definitely getting weaker in the gym and a visible muscle loss. What was happening? My body was going into a starvation mode. My body was protecting its fat because it's its only source of energy at a certain point, right? Most of the energy, I should say, is coming from fat. So it goes, I'm going to hold on to that at all costs. And it'll blunt the insulin receptors. It's that smart. And insulin is a fat-storing hormone, and you hold on to fat. And that's exactly, if you look, you know, what actually triggered that thought is I found studies saying low-carb diets cause insulin resistance. And I'm going, wait a minute, uh, we cure diabetes with this, right? You know, don't use the cure. The body cures diabetes with this, right? So how is that possible? Well, it is. And it's not from a clinical standpoint of a receptor that's burned out or the body's attacking it. It's because the DNA is turning that receptor down so you hold on to your fat. Clever. All right, so anyways, that is part of what happens. But women's success in general on low-carb diets and fasting. So we know that women have more trouble with this yet, but when I went to the tribe in Africa, the women were fasting doing the same thing. So we know it's something that's going on in this country hormonally that definitely caused women to have a little more problem with this, for sure. Hormone issues such as thyroid adrenals. People will say, oh, if you have thyroid adrenals, you can't fast, you can't do low-carb diets. I would admit those people have more trouble doing low-carb diets long-term or fasting. But there is an answer. Let's look at this closer. Problem number one, let's solve that. I already explained this. The problem is, is when you lower the, when you're in ketosis or low carb long enough, fat becomes your number one energy source and your body will do everything to hold on to it. Why? Because it wants to survive. So it will either blunt the insulin receptor or it'll add more water to the fat cells. And that's why I actually started getting that dimply fat. And why was that? Because the fat cells that I had, it was slowing down fat metabolism by just pushing water into the fat cell. It's brilliant. The body's that smart, but we don't like that. So that's problem number one. So by the way, is let's go back to that. So what's the obvious solution here? And I, I gave the wood as an example. And let, let me make that point, okay? And you've, most of you have heard me say this a thousand times. But, but like Shane said, you hear it again and again, eventually you're going to have to teach it. So you hear me say it again, you're, you can teach it. People get this example, though. Okay, you're in a cabin in the middle of the woods, and you have a certain amount of wood. See that huge wood stack? That's supposed to last you all winter. You're basing that amount of wood on previous winters to get through the winter, right? This winter is like the winter we just experienced in Park City. Horrible winter, right? Super cold and long and big snow. So you find yourself depleting your wood pile much faster than normal. So what are you going to do in your cabin? Are you going to keep burning the same amount of wood? Of course not. You're going to burn less and be happy at 60 degrees, not 70 or 50, whatever it is. That's your metabolism. Your metabolism sees the wood pile dropping, you know, and it says, wait a minute, all we have is this is our fuel, so let's hold on to it. I want to survive. Your body wants to survive. So let's slow down the burning of the wood. Same with your fat. Okay, your friend stops by and says, holy cow, man, I've got so much wood. You know, I'll dump you and give you more wood. So he dumps off a ton of wood. That's analogous of what? A feast day. And what are you going to do once you get more wood? Yeah, you're going to burn it up, crank it up. That's what happens. Two days after a feast day, visibly you can see you're leaner. And your numbers, your ketones go through the roof, right? Because your body goes, okay, we can burn now. It's not rocket science. It's survival. It's adaptation. That's all it is. So the obvious solution to problem one is 
adding weekly variation in feast days. Not famine, feast days. We'll talk about famine. Problem number two is low insulin increases glucose. Actually, Joe Mercullus sent me that article, and I have like three others. But and I, in the book, I cite them. But one of the functions of insulin is turning off gluconeogenesis. So what we know is there's many functions of insulin, right? We know that insulin plays a role here of stopping your body from even burning its own muscle. So the solution, again, is random feast days to turn off this because we want to spike up insulin and we can stop this gluconeogenesis that can occur on low, long-term Carbohydrate, uh, low carb diets. Hormone conversion. We know that we need insulin to make many of these conversions, right? And I just interviewed um, a scientist. I don't think it came out yet, Ashley. Who was I interviewing? That, um, oh, the, the oxaloacetate scientist, remember? The physicist that taught. And he was saying, well, the problem is you need insulin for the brain it, to convert, to utilize estrogen. And he was talking about how the brain, women with low estrogen, you know, you need insulin for the brain to utilize estrogen, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that, that's another reason why when we add feast days in, especially in women, we see this like amazing, I feel better, because now their brain's actually able to utilize glucose, and he was explaining how uh, estrogen is a part of that. And again, you need insulin to convert the T4 into the more active T3. You need insulin for that. So the moment you start adding in some glucose and insulin days, your body starts making those conversions. There was a question. About 100, and I'll show this, about 100 to 200 grams of carbs. Now, here's the whole thing, though. Many of you will say, I just am tolerant to carbohydrates. Anything that raises a pathway called mTOR works. So you can do high feast days or feast days with high carbs. And that could be sweet potatoes, yams, fruits, whatever carbs your body likes, use. Or it could be high protein works too. As you're going to see, it raises this mTOR, and that's really what we're doing. And then even calories. So on my feast day, I do try to eat more often and more calories, and I definitely like the carbs. Sometimes I throw in high protein too. Just like literally one gram of protein per gram of body weight or per pound of body weight. So 150, I try to get like 150 grams of protein that day, which is a lot for me. It's hard. But bodybuilders do it because it works. They throw their body into this mTOR phase, and they basically start, you know, this muscle anabolic phase is what it is. Short term, it's great. Long term, it actually ages you, and I'll explain that more. But anyways, so we need insulin. So when we pop insulin up, but here's the thing. You know, what, we, what I learned here is monthly variation actually works better for this, meaning if we take five days a month and do higher carbohydrates or protein, Hormonally, especially in women, we have a major shift for the rest of the month. And my doctor, Mindy, you've noticed it personally, right? Because you are definitely in need of that higher carbohydrate to drive up more insulin and transform this hormonal pathway. And again, I, you have to listen to that interview because you, uh, he talks about, I'm going to re-listen to it myself because he was talking about how that's needed for, you know, in the brain and estrogen, and I was very fascinated by it. All right, problem three is, um, or problem four. Oh, I'm not going to do problem four yet. I'm going to talk about this. Okay, so now look, we have weekly variation. In the book, in this book, week one, what, what would you say, people that know the book, don't answer. What would you think week one would be as far as preparing for fasting? What would week one be? Would you say fast? <laughs> uh, lots of fats. Okay, you're actually partly right there because it's putting someone in ketosis, fat adaptation. Week one, because that takes three weeks. We want to start that ball rolling. Week two is, okay, people are eating, the average American's eating many, many meals a day, right? It's this, it's this. These are all meals. They all, you know, are basically causing insulin and glucose to go up. So we just say eat three meals. And during that week, we teach them to live longer healthy, the only thing that really adds up is eating less. But you've heard me say it, don't eat less, eat what? So we teach them that valuable lesson. We take them one step at a time. Week three, instead of calling it fasting, we say pick a smaller window to eat in. Change your eating window. You choose it. Because which window do I pick? When do I eat? I, you choose. What works for your schedule? 
but we take it and say, try eating in a 10-hour window, an 8-hour window. And then as we go along, we just squeeze the window down. Because what we're doing is, I call it metabolic mitochondrial fitness. By forcing it down, we're just exercising the mitochondria, getting ready for the what? The fast. So we want to exercise their mitochondria, and we're doing it by squeezing their eating window. But in the book, I tell you how to test to know which is an eating window that's working for you, right? Because you have to know it's different for everybody, but that low glucose and high ketone thing that we measure is a way to see if the eating window is actually working. People are fascinated because you're giving them tools and they, have, they feel like they have empowerment. You know, it's like, and it, it's fun. It's fun is to do as a group. So anyways, the, the weekly, the, then we have chapter four, which is where diet variation actually starts. So that chapter is diet variation. And basically, it's 511 is where we start them, where we pick one day a week. You pick it. I do it on my busiest day. I don't ever plan it. It just happens. And just eat one meal. Later, you could say eat one meal at 500 calories, but just eat one meal, you know, and pick the day. But then what's the other one? It's five. Feast, right. Five days of ketosis, the way they're eating it, in the window that they chose one day of eating one meal, and another day of feasting. And you have to get them to understand that the feast day, as you just learned, is as important as the fast day. We have to remind the body it's not starving. We need to spike that insulin to help the hormones convert. I mean, all of that helps them. And of course, there's other ones. We evolved them into the 421, which would be two feast, uh, fast days a week. And by the way, your adrenal people, your thyroid people, they may do better with more feast days. And I teach them that, right? So they may do better with actually two feast days. So again, it's not the same for everyone, but they'll discover that, I'm sure, on their own. So anyways, then there's the monthly variation where we're doing five to seven days a month. And I'm going to show you something that we learned that is really powerful on the monthly standpoint. And then there's seasonal, right? Seasonally, you know, changing your diet, I think it's as basic as ever, but nobody does it. Everyone sticks to the diet that helped them at one point. Vegan, vegetarian, keto, paleo, and they're hardcore there because it helped them. And I get that. But the fact is, it's not my opinion, eating the same diet is not good for your, your microbiome. It affects every aspect. According to Shane, it even affects the plaster on your walls. I mean, that's how powerful it is. So no matter what, it affects the microbiome. And he's right about that, not about the plaster. But the fact is, is that it does. It has a negative effect on the microbiome. We know that every time you shift your diet, you create an adaptation that occurs. And studies are showing that it forces an adaptation in the microbiome, and it creates diversity. Adaptation is the magic. It's like exercise for your microbiome. But it does other things. When you change your diet, we have a hormone optimization. Your body literally has to adapt to that dietary change, like exercise. So hang on to that thought, and we'll, we'll go further. All right, so, oh, there's the, I, I threw that in. Here's the MIT study. 24-hour fast regenerates stem cells and doubles metabolism. Holy cow. The research found, I, this was a quote, I should have quoted it, but I just put this in this morning. The research found that fasting for just one day caused intestinal cell regeneration to double. That's pretty, no wonder clinically, right, docs, that we see what we see with fasting. No wonder. Pretty cool. All right. Oh, the protocols. So these right here, if you want them, talk to my staff. So um, we had the protocols. Give them the protocols that we did for Bulletproof or Paleo, okay? So if you want to see those actual protocols, because the book's not out until January, um, we'll, we'll make sure you get them. Corey, what did I say January? No, I meant June. You know, I didn't even know the days of the year until, like, I was, like, in high school. People are like, January or February, how do you know that? Because my dyslexia, I screwed them all up, right? I would literally have to sing them, you know, just to, like, know them. Like, I, it was just insanity. So for me to say January, I'm doing pretty well up here. Yeah, yeah. You know, this week, like, I, I actually ate one meal yesterday and the day before I ate one meal. I didn't plan that. It just happened, right? Because I was, you know, here, that, you know, it just happened that I ate just one meal. Um, however, for beginners, I, I like separating it even more. Like, when you get to a 4 two, one 
I prefer they actually separate it. But if it works out two in a row, it's fine. So I like people not being like really strict with it. When you'll note that days are very busy is the best days. If you say Wednesday's the day, you, you know, Tuesday night, you're like, oh, God, I got to eat one time. Don't do that to yourself. Because what happens is you just kind of evolve into the day. And by, you know, 2, 3 o'clock, you're like, screw it. I can wait till 6 o'clock. You know what I'm saying? So it works out better that way. And then by the end of it, like I said, doing three days of fat, I typically do th- probably three days of one meal. And now with the, with, uh, the shake, I'm going to do a lot more 500 calories on those days. Matter of fact, I, I'm probably going to discipline myself to doing two a week with just the shake. You know, because, I, I, again, it, it's a, when you can keep autophagy going more consistently, and then I fast at least four times a year longer fast, and I don't even know that you have to do that. I think if you're healthy, Safereed said 95%, re, you know, cancer prevention reduction by doing one fast a year, right? So one fast, I mean, that's what the Huns of people did. They were, you know, they called it fasting spring. So even one fast a year makes a difference, but I'm a little obsessive, so I like to do four. Four's definitely got to be better. That's the way my brain works. Then I'm on the couch sick. Why'd you take so much? Anyway, this is a really important uh, thing here. There's two pathways with feast famine that are going on. The, the plant-based people, the Walter Longo group, they hate this word, mTOR. They just, right, Don? They hate mTOR. And I think Don's going to expand on mTOR. mTOR I always go back and go, how bad could it be? I mean, you know, it's, it's a pathway God created. Our bodies do. Fact is, is that mTOR long-term is bad, right? I mean, I think the, uh, someone came out recently and said they calculated the average age of a bodybuilder, and it was 63, okay? And that doesn't even include the fact that from 43 to 53, they had debilitating arthritis. They had, you know, I mean, it was all kinds of bad degenerative stuff happens before they actually die. But that's pretty bad, man, considering, what is it, 73 in this country? 10 years off the, uh, the, the, the average? Holy cow. Why? Because bodybuilders, look at what drives mTOR. Do they increase calories to put muscle on? Yes or no? Do they do high carbs? They love carbs, right? Yeah. And they do what? High protein, right? Isn't the goal... Bodybuilders isn't the goal, right? What's the goal of a, a bodybuilder, a, a protein? Yeah, how much do they say? Yeah, as much as you weigh, right? One gram per body. Po- yeah, by the way, that's, that's why I said if you want a high protein day, get one gram per body weight because I know from the bodybuilders that that's what works, right? You want to put muscle on, you get one gram of protein per gram of body weight, you're going to gain muscle. Why? Because you're driving this mTOR pathway, which is a cell-replicating repli- anabolic pathway. So here's the, here's the other cool thing. Every bodybuilder would tell you, when they went on steroids that enforced this major anabolic state, they felt amazing. Trust me, they'll all tell you that their joint pains went away, that all like, oh my gosh, I felt amazing, but does that last? No. But when they go in temporarily in that massive anabolic state, healing occurs. When I was in Africa, man, when they had a kill, they had protein beyond, trust me, beyond their body weight. Massive mTOR. But then they were forced into having no kill for several weeks. You get the point. Feast famine. Our DNA is set up for it. But just so you understand the pathway, this pathway can be healing or damaging. This pathway can be healing or damaging. That's why I'm always saying, listen, too much fasting is not necessarily good. It will drive a catabolic state. Listen, what do the vegan vegetarian people look like? They look like that, right? So when, when Bill, your dad and I would go to the fasting things, we saw these. At a certain point, we both said, I don't want to look like these people. I, I don't even know why health-wise. So even if they live longer, I don't want to look like them. The fact was is they were pushing autophagy. You know, maybe not necessarily, you know, even fasting too much, but they were pushing it via calories, low protein, all of it. They were pushing a calorie. By the way, so Walter Longo's predecessor, he was in the group where they were like, caloric restriction, live longer, right? The, the Biosphere 2 project, they went in for two years in the Biosphere. Perfect. They ate a 30 to 35% reduction in calories. Two years of this. Complete fail. They came out catabolic. Their organs shrunk. and Their immune systems were trashed. Now, they did turn on the CERT-1 act, the lifelong Jevy, so it looked like they would live longer, but the fact is, is they would have died from infection. 
Yeah, so it, it didn't work. It was a fail. But what Longo took out of it is, wait a minute, what if we do short bursts of this? Yes, short burst is good, whether it's weekly, monthly. So what if we do five days a month of this and five days a month of this? That's what I thought. Because Longo's work, if they're doing five days a month of this, and they're seeing these results in mice, type beta cells coming back via stem cells and all that. What if we do this with it and drive this healing pathway? It worked. So five days a month, if you did even a partial fast, you took the Catabo shake daily, five days a month, three servings, right? And then feasted, pick five days. I don't like them back to back, separated a little bit, and feasted. Ladies, the best time to do it is the week before your period to not fast, but to what? Yeah. Why would that be? New people. Why would that be? I don't know why I think this side of the room is the old people. I mean, it's a mix here. I, I just, my brain's working good with this. So you guys are all new, even though you're not. Okay. So why would that be? Why would it be? Okay. Because a ton of hormone conversion is needed a week before the period is. Ladies, when do you get your biggest amounts of cravings? Is that innate intelligence? Maybe. Listen. Listen to it. And all of a sudden, the low-carb diet that wasn't working, the fasting that you weren't feeling like you were getting the most out of, like your husband, all of a sudden, bam, it kicks in. Because what we know is not only were your hormones better the week before and during the period, but for the rest of the month, it was transformative. So therefore, if we do feast famine weekly, which I just taught you, and you do feast famine monthly, magic happens. So the book takes you through how that process. By week five, now I'm teaching you how to do this weekly variation, monthly and weekly, and by the time you step into the fast, you're getting maximum autophagy and stem cell. It's brilliant. It works. And it wasn't genius, trust me. So monthly variation strategies, that's what I just taught you, right? Five days of autophagy, five days of mTOR, right? And then weekly, four to one on the other days of the month. So this, this is, I think this strategy is the most healing of all, right? It's like, just to keep it simple, five days a month of autophagy, five days a month, and again, I, five days a month of doing the Catabo shake. I, every once in a while you throw in a water fast. Why, why bog them down with complete water fasting all the time? Even if you did one a year, but all the other times you do the Catabo shake and you're doing five, five, and then the other days of the month, you're doing four, two, one, which is too fast. Again, that, if you take it to the next level, that could be day, two days of just Catabo shake, and you're getting partial fasting in one feast day. I love this. Yep, and it, and it works. Clinically, it's really powerful. So who is right, after all? We already answered that. And that's the group that I got to see three times in my life. You know, amazing. This woman back here was actually her. She had a twin. They were over 100 years old, and they were amazing. They didn't have words for diseases that we had. These kids were incredible. Look at their teeth, but I'm going to tell you something else. The other tribes that were in that area, these folks came down out of the mountain. That's why we were able to meet them. You know why they came out of the mountain? Because they droughted for years. They were in a major, like, feast famine thing going on where they would get something to, to the point where, okay, we have to come down out of the mountain. and then. You know, these people, then they were civilizing them, putting them in the clothes from World Vision. And my thing was to the leaders that were there, don't give them the food. Because the question literally was stated. I don't understand. These people don't eat, Dr. Palm. I'm like, what do you mean they don't eat? Because they were eating one meal a day thing, right? He says, no, they, they don't eat. We never see them eating. I'm like, well, you know, they're eating. <laughs> but they never get sick. Why is that? And I said, well, if you want to see them get sick, start feeding them what the other tribes are, st are starting to eat. He's like, yeah, because we're starting to see the same diseases in them, which we never did, as we are in the city. You know, and so that was happening. So, you know, I was able to do a little education, but I doubt it'll help. I mean, they'll evolve, I'm sure. But this tribe actually was different. It was their chief that refused. He said, we're sticking to our ways, and he had a name for that. But, you know, so he was refusing it. They were already offering it. So... If he dies, who knows what will happen in the next generation. But he was refusing. They were sticking to their things. And I, I was pretty cool to see that. So obviously we can look at a tribe like this, the Hunza people. And 
adapt or die. And I, I just threw this in here, and I don't have time to show you. But so does, you know, when you see this craze about hot cold, do you realize why hot cold works or going into cold? Shane, look, the microbiome, right? Researcher reported in Cell, great, great uh, journal. A microbe, Shane, you love that microbe, right? Anyways, acromancy, acromancia, that's how you say it, associated with obesity and diabetes virtually disappeared. So temperature creates a hormone optimization, and that's the point. It's why? Because it's adaptation, right? So does the body have to adapt to diet changes. Yes, it does. And it does it the same things we see. So we see all of these hormones change, increase in growth hormone, increase in norepinephrine, which downregulates inflammation, increase in hormone sensitivity, luteinizing. I mean, all the same things we see in, in cold temperature change, all the same thing we see in exercise, all happen with dietary change, right? So when you look at this, my wife fasts all the time. And in her 50s, she's put on more muscle. It's a myth, and it happens a month after a fast. You typically gain more muscle because autophagy gets rid of the bad cells that aren't recovering, and the stem cells create new muscles that do recover, and that's why it's a myth that you're going to fast your muscle away. It's baloney. Increased growth hormone, norepinephrine, hormone sensitivity. We get it when we exercise. We force adaptation. We get that, and you get better, right? If you adapt, we get it even with hot cold, is now, you know, Wim Hof and all that stuff and going to cold, we get that. But we don't get it with diet. But it's the same thing. Dietary change creates adaptation the same way exercise does. And that's why. All right, cool. That's it. Problem four, and I'm not going to get in with this group. Normally I would at like Paleo FX. But the fourth problem is cellular toxicity. Right? We know that this is why people with hormone problems, et cetera, can't fast, have trouble fasting. I already made the point. You put the detox and these fasting strategies and diet variation strategies together, magic happens. You know, so this group, I didn't have to educate on this problem. But you can't do one without the other. And that brings my whole talk to a full circle. If when I learned fasting years ago, we didn't have the detox component. And that's probably why it was shelved. God gave it back to me now, because when you put detox, the cellular detox, and the fasting together, group magic happens. Am I right? That's it. I have to get off. She's coming on. So I'll, I'll answer your question back here, though. So, okay, you're good. Let's give Dr. Palm a big round of applause. I'm going to take this. <laughs>